Welcome to Score Talk, a GCN podcast discussing gems in the history of film music. I'm Zev Burrows, coming to you live from New York City. And I'm Ryan Back, coming to you live from sunny London, UK. Sunny London. Oh man, yeah, I wish that's... I wish it, I wish it were so right that's, here in New York because that's... it's freezing cold. It's really not sunny. That's a, bit, a hint of sarcasm right there. It's grey oh. as the day is long. I, I don't like to imagine London as being grey. I imagine London as this very romantic place and you know I was there about seven years ago and I miss it dearly. Well let me tell you something, some of the appeal of London is actually its greyness because it's so like it's synonymous with bad weather like it can be romantic even in the rain so right. yeah that's not such a terrible thing. Wow. So this, so the idea of this podcast and the goal really is just to discuss gems that either are very well known or that um, that sort of elude, um, that sort of sneak under the radar um, with regards to today's film scores and mm -hmm. what people are talking about. And we want to shed some light on some um, on some scores that are excellent, excellent scores, but. Um, just don't get as much attention. But we thought for this podcast, we'd start off with something slightly more well known, and you know, and so in the coming weeks, we'll probably have a poll where it's a mixture of um, more well known stuff, but also some really weird stuff that maybe like two or three people have heard about. Right. So, and I mean, and all of these, um, all the all the movies that we list on this podcast, uh, on this poll, even though we're only picking one to discuss on the podcast, I mean, we encourage all of you here to check out all of them because, in each of the cases, even if we may not discuss them, they all have very interesting things to say, both um, in terms of its storytelling and also in terms of score. So, and we're going to be choosing from a variety of different composers, different directors. Um, and from different parts of the world too. So yeah, and different points in time as well, which is also very important, um, oh, because yeah. particularly to, with um, with today's uh, score choice that we're going to discuss. Um, I mean, Bernard Herrmann uh, is such a prolific, was such a prolific uh, composer, and as you said, um, you know they're well known, but the oldies, especially with today's generation, they don't get the attention they deserve. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much we can learn from them. Um, we so still, we're, we're still, we're still catching up with uh, Bernard Herrmann's sense of psychology, and mm -hmm. especially, especially in regards to his Hitchcock stuff. And today's movie that we're going to be discussing is 1959's masterpiece, North by Northwest, mm -hmm. which um, it's which, as Stephen Smith, who was Herman's biographer, describes as the grand summation of Hitchcock's wrong man thriller. Hitchcock had already kind of touched on this theme of uh, the innocent man on the run from the law. He had covered it at least two times, uh, prominently before he came to America. He had, he had covered it in movies such as The 39 Steps and Young and Innocent, uh, both from the 1930s. And then he came to America in 1940 um, and remained in the United States, pretty much in Hollywood, right up until his death in 1980. Mm -hmm. um, Bernard Herrmann started out in New York um, in radio and uh, worked with CBS for a number of years in the 1930s, met Orson Welles sometime in 1938, and they worked together on 500-some radio shows, and it was their War of the Worlds broadcast that got Hollywood's attention. Right. And they invited Wells to come and do his first feature film, which ended up being Citizen Kane, which is routinely called by numerous people the greatest film ever made. It was Herman's very first film score. He earned an Oscar nomination for it. Um, and I, uh, uh, I read, just to add to that, I read that he actually scored the entire, the entire score um, in a little under a month. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he had, he had well, just come off doing Twilight Zone. Oh, we're getting back. We're getting back to North by Northwest. I guess I'm just referring to just his genius altogether. It doesn't have to even oh, yeah. uh, correspond I, to, to North by Northwest. I, but he's, I mean, clearly. I think genius. I think genius is a little bit uh, of an understatement here. <laughs> probably, probably. But, but I'm also biased because he's my favorite composer. Of I all time. know. I know. So, yeah. Well, it's a good um, place to start then. Mm -hmm. 
So um, according to according to the soundtrack notes that were done by a gentleman named Christopher Husted, who uh, is a musicologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I actually met Husted a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. Um, he said that Herman began sketching North by Northwest on January 10th, 1959, and... Uh, reach the last of more than 140 pages of orchestral nice. score on March 2nd. And uh, the scoring sessions took place um, in April, but the rest uh, didn't happen until May because Hitchcock spent some time re-editing the film and um, mm-hmm. and some and a lot of the music was on the cutting room floor. Certain scenes had to be rescored. And um, in the case, especially in the case of the Mount Rushmore score, um, which we'll get to shortly. But um, right. what um, before? I mean, before we we pick on the nitty gritties of, of the score, like how would you describe the general vibe of this particular score for North by Northwest? Well, it's uh, it's uh, Hitchcock's. Pro- it's probably the greatest he ever did in terms of innocent man on the run it's his it's easily the most stylish that he did um and it was uh one of his it was uh it was his last movie that he made with cary grant too and mm-hmm. cary cary grant being one of the best uh one of the best male leading uh leading men in the history of hollywood i think um mm-hmm. and what herman um herman referred to uh Grant had an, a Fred Astaire like agility, and so originally, if you look at the open, and especially in the opening of North by Northwest, because it takes place in New York City, and on and the movie starts on Madison Avenue, um, MGM execs kind of wanted Gershwin. They wanted this sort of hustle bustle Gershwin type of music, but that would have been totally wrong. That would have been quite. Been, ja- it wasn't Gershwin known for jazz. It he was um, well Gershwin sort of. Uh, was known for f- uh, fusing together a lot of uh, tropes of classical music with I jazz, see. and um, you know you, you can hear that in Rhapsody in Blue. You can hear that in American in Paris, mm-hmm. um, and a ton of other pieces uh, that he'd written, like Porgy and Bess. But um, but that would have been all wrong for and as much as I adore Gershwin. Um, that would have been all wrong for North by Northwest mm-hmm. um, because it doesn't. Gershwin's style of music, it doesn't set you up for a thriller. Um, and Herman used this um, this Spanish dance called the Fandango. And because it's animated. That's and, right. And because there's a lot of different twists and turns. And it's just unrelenting. It's vigorous, as Husted describes here. And it just it sets you up for what's going to be in, st- in score in store. Herman um, often said that the main title cue is the most important cue in a movie because it sets you up for what the entire picture is going to be like yes. in most in most circumstances. And you see that in you see that in Vertigo. You see that in Psycho. You see Definitely. that especially you see that in North by Northwest and plenty of other pictures that he scored especially and. And composers, um, you know, were still, I don't know that, uh, and a lot of main titles are kind of thrown out nowadays in favor of songs, which songs, they're almost, I mean, as, as much as as much as much some of them may work, it, it almost, unless you're going for a specific vibe, you really, I think if, I think a main title, I like, I miss main titles personally. Well, I, I think that the beauty of a main title that's scored is that you're, you're opening it up for the viewer to interpret what the movie's tone is going to be. And mm-hmm. when you put a song with lyrics, you're kind of, well... Unless, unless you're doing a musical. Well then, okay, that's a different story. But with a, with a song with lyrics, you kind of, straight away from the start of the movie, you're already alluding to what this movie is going to contain. And I that's... don't know, I think a good movie... Um, a good movie, a good director, a good, a good composer um, will allow the audience to do that work for themselves. And I think that's mm-hmm. important. I mean, I think Herman's really good at that. Oh, yeah. Her, well, Herman was a master at that. Um, it, I mean, if we're going to go off track a little bit and talk about Psycho, mm-hmm. Herm, uh, Hitch, Hitchcock hated the original cut of Psycho. He was going to cut it down to 
um, he was going to cut it down to an hour for his uh, Alfred Hitchcock Presents series. And Herman said, no, 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 no. Give it to me. Go away for your Christmas holidays. <laughs> let, me see, let, me see what I, let me see what I can do with it. And you, you hear it in the main title. Um, it's just these stabbing strings that just set you up for what the movie is going to be about. And then, of course, um, maybe I should shut my mouth on that be- for people who haven't seen Psycho. Because, you know... <laughs> no, talk, talk. That's what we're here for. Um, well, I mean, um, it, it kind of, uh, the movie does make um, a very, very big twist. Probably the single biggest twist in the history of cinema. Um, you know, when, with the shower scene, of course, it uh-huh. becomes some, something else entirely. That's not the case with North by Northwest, but the but the main title still sets you up for that tone. And that's really the most important word is the tone. Yeah of what the movie is going to be about. And Herman Herman understood psycho- that, that psychology better than pretty much, better than almost everybody who was working in Hollywood at that time, and he still understands it better than most people in the industry today. I mean, I, I, I can probably name maybe a couple of people who, and, who understand it as maybe as well as he does, but mm-hmm. we're, sti- we're still unraveling secrets from Herman and in the case and in the case of uh, North by Northwest there is so much to learn from his yes. from his sense of uh, scoring action and scoring um, something yeah. that's ominous and it's so um, exciting it's like it's like being like a like a musical archaeologist you know mm-hmm. we're still digging <laughs> we're still finding we're little still. nuggets of, of brilliance right. yeah oh, so um, with with this overture, um, which um, he allows for, which uh, this was Hitchcock's, uh, no, this was Herman's only movie for MGM. He spent most of his time uh, scoring pictures for 20th Century Fox, but um, in the case, it, what I really love about this is that the movie opens uh, with the overture, this looming overture that starts out on uh, timpani and... Mm-hmm. Uh, cellos and basses they integrate it with the roar of leo the lion and it just it works so beautifully that's it's one of my is it's one of my favorite things in the history of cinema yeah they say it's called the escape motif um let me see i mean from my, my little research that i've done which begins with timpanis and low strings yeah um, um and, you, and then, and you, and then and it begin and then it like turns into this like fully fledged energetic with a fandango. fandango, and I think that exactly, and I think that is appropriate to call it the escape motif because there are because the points where it is where it is used in the movie are where he, uh, Cary Grant's character, mm. um, is escaping from something. Yeah. He it's used again where he's escaping in the car um, as he you know makes as he's j- just after he's been um, intoxicated heavily by these, uh, agents. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then again, in that very, very famous crop duster sequence, um, where they start the music, um, right as the plane crashes into the tank. Um, and there's a, there's a great, there's a great passage about it in the Herman bio, um, where he said, where they say, um, apparently, I've, I've had someone actually, somebody on, uh, I think it was Michael Levine on on GCN's thread mm-hmm. for this. Mm-hmm. He, I don't know if you've noticed, but he wrote that uh, Bern, um, Herman was was complimented for his music, particularly in mm-hmm. that scene. He said, "Yes, I've been told that my music was the best in that scene when there was barely any music." Obviously, he, right. he was joking, but the truth <laughs> is. <laughs> But the truth is that was that was the beauty of that scene. Definitely, it is. I mean, it was most impactful because we had so much silence and we were like at the edge of our seats, waiting for to see what was going to happen to this poor Cary Grant. I forgot his his character name in the movie. Um, Thornhill. That's right. And then boom, you know, music begins with with Herman's violins and strings, and it's all very tense. As it's, as, it's as Stephen as Stephen Smith notes in the bio, he says the absence of scoring. Uh, reinforces Hitchcock's sense of heightened reality. Um, and Herman said in an interview, if you're a painter, it doesn't mean that you can't use black. And that is a sound, black. Yeah, he's, he's right. And that's, that's so and profound. It's so, it's so interesting. And um, that's, and, you know, and it, just, and it just speaks so much to Herman's sense of spotting. Um, 
you know, he may have been, like I said, one of the most brilliant psychologists who ever worked in film. Mm -hmm. um, was this so. just a was this just a natural talent, or did he actually have some kind of background? Uh, I don't know, psych psychology background, or, or was he just very in tune with what he was? He was just, uh, as far as I know, he didn't receive any sort of psychology degree. But um, <laughs> but no, his his sense of drama, and it probably came from his days in radio. Um, because he, he would score his early pictures like Citizen Kane and uh, The Magnificent Ambersons um, to obviously two Orson Welles movies and Welles also came out of the radio they, sc they were scored very much like um, they were scored very much like radio dramas and right. um, in regards to Kane um, Herman says uh, I'm looking for it right here um he says, uh, I use a great deal of what, me, what might be termed radio scoring. The movies frequently overlook opportunities for musical cues, which last only a few seconds. That is from five to 15 seconds at the most. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being that the eye usually covers the transition. Um, I felt that in this film, where the photographic um, contrasts were often so sharp and sudden, a brief cue, even two or three chords, might heighten the effect immeasurably. And that's certainly true of Kane. And it's true of North by Northwest, too, although, I mean, Hitchcock and Wells are two very, very different filmmakers, and both with um, different intentions on how to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think, you know, um, you know, in, in a sense, Herman's work with Wells may have warmed him up for working with Hitchcock, and, um, and also his work with Joseph Mankiewicz, um, in the early four, in the late forties and early fifties, mm -hmm. which is another area we could cover, but we don't, we just don't have time for that. Should so, we, uh, yeah. should we play a cue for our listeners? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so yeah, so moving on. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so this movie concerns uh, Roger Thornhill, an advertising executive on Madison Avenue, who is mm -hmm. swept up um, into this uh, into something that he has no idea, no conception, and these peop these agents, who we later learn are trying to uh, to smuggle government secrets um, out of the country. They think that he is an agent who is tailing them, and he gets caught up, and there's absolutely no way that they can be convinced otherwise, and he um, is later wrongly accused for a murder um, and ends up on the run from, he's now both on the run from these agents and mm -hmm. from, and from, the, and from uh, the police, too, and it's not until the government um, interferes late in the film that he's able to sort of piece this all together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just, um, and this collection of characters that, uh, that he comes into contact with is just so, is, is so rich. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've seen this movie like 14 or 15 times and uh, I watch it every year. I just, I adore this movie. It's, it's in my top 10 favorite movies easily. Um, yeah. And uh, largely, largely because of the cast, largely because the script, the script is so sharp. Uh, it was scripted by Ernest Lemon, who was a uh, friend of Herman's, and he said, "I've got to get you and Hitchcock together." Is he and, is he a frequent collaborator with with Hitchcock? Because I found I haven't watched a ton of Hitchcock films. Um, I think watching North by Northwest was my third. But mm -hmm. I, I'd watched previously Psycho and Vertigo, also from from your recommendations. Um, it says here. But, it says on. But, but but I found always the dialogue um, to be 
really sharp and really witty and I love oh, yeah. it. It's great. I mean, that oh, must, yeah. I, I don't know if his writers are, are British or American, but a lot of the time I felt like, okay, this is really British writing at its best. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because he, you know, was born on mm -hmm. Long Island, but, um, who was you know, born on Long Island? Ernest Lemon. Yeah. Okay. I, I, when I'm, I'm thinking of Hitchcock now, cause he's British, but, right. and I, you know, but, obviously but, he oversees the whole thing as director. Right. I right. just found it to be really like it matched Hitchcock, like it matched the fact that he was a Brit. <laughs> oh, 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 absolutely! And I think yeah. uh, I'm I'm looking at some of Lemon's other credits now. Uh, he's he wrote one of he wrote the final movie for Hitchcock called Family Plot. Which an interesting note about Family Plot: it's the only movie for Hitchcock that has a score by John Williams. Yes, um, I've heard of this. Sure. And. Uh, and that was just after Williams had uh, won the Oscar for Jaws, mm -hmm. and uh, about a year before he scored Star Wars. Um, but looking at Lyman's other credits, he scripted um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with mm -hmm. uh, Liz Taylor. He uh, wrote the screen. He adapted the screenplays for The Sound of Music and West Side Story, and also The King and I. So he. Um, he has some pretty distinctive credits to them, and I mean, I think of all of those pictures, uh, North by Northwest has my favorite screenplay, and he said for this one, I wanted to write the Hitchcock picture to end all Hitchcock pictures. Right. So, so yeah, wow. I think, um, and, and I think it shows because the, the dialogue is so smart and so tight and there's so many each time i watch it i laugh at something new um why, why do you think he went for williams for, for that last movie i'm curious well, think, what is there do you think there's a there's a, a correlation between the two i mean i find sometimes when i listen to john williams work that he's taken a lot of influences from herman so i'm wondering well, yeah i how, think i think i think uh there's a there's a thing on there's a quote on the um, somewhere that apparently, because Herman and Hitchcock broke after um, after uh, their disagreement on the score for a movie called Torn Curtain. This was after they had worked together for about ten years, uh, mm -hmm. and they had, they had collaborated on eight movies. And Hitch and Herman was set to do um, Torn Curtain, and this was the second time that he had disregarded Hitchcock's. Instructions. The first was the shower scene in Psycho, where it heightened the movie that to such a point that Hitchcock hadn't even imagined, and where he eventually said that 33% of the effect of Psycho was due to Herman's music. Mm -hmm. This was the sec This was the second disagreement of theirs, where Herman disregarded uh, Hitchcock's instruction to do a pop score. Hitchcock was pressured by the studios to to be more hip to today's modern audiences and he thought and Hitchcock or someone had the idea to use a pop score and um, and he said well maybe Herman could do that but he didn't tell Herman specifically that he wanted a pop score and when Herman when Herman played back the prelude to Hitchcock for Torn Curtain he was immediately fired um, and they wow. never never worked together again although really after all that oh, history oh yeah oh yeah i mean they as john williams uh said in the bio they had they were two men with tremendously big egos um who <laughs> yeah. let who had a lot of who let a lot of things um go unnoticed that should that shouldn't have gone unnoticed and um there's a quote on the orson wells website called wellsnet that said Apparently, Hitchcock did ask Herman back to score his last film, Family Plot, right before Herman died. And, and Herman had a full plate of films scheduled for that year um, and was happy to ignore Hitchcock's reunion offer. I don't know how much I believe that, mm. but, um, but there is a quote from... Um, there's a quote in the Herman bio where uh, Hitchcock was speaking at USC, and someone asked him if he would work with Herman again, and he replied, uh, as Smith says, with thick condescension, <laughs> "Yes, if he'll do as he's told." Oh. So, so I'm, I'm, and knowing, and you know, with my observations on the two on the two men, I think that um, he would never have asked Herman back. I, I, I'm skeptical of that. Of course, you know, I'm not saying that. 
he didn't, but I'm skeptical. But let, let um, me just ask you though, I mean, you said that the sure. shower scene in Psycho took the movie to a whole new level with the music. Oh, yeah. And, right. and okay, he, dis he, he, he disobeyed uh, what Hitchcock originally wanted from him, but, right. but clearly it was a massive success. So, I mean, was it not? Well, Hitchcock, Hitchcock said when he gave her in the film, he said, do what you like, but no music for the shower sequence. That must be without music. And, you know, and, you know, it's hard to imagine that sequence. I'm sure you could find it without music, just to study it, just to study just how much it adds. Sure. Um, I'm sure. But, but this, was, this was an instance where um, Hitchcock was wrong, but I'm, but I'm definite. I'm... I, I would suspect that he disliked having somebody else prove him wrong, and he was uncomfortable with this. Right. Okay. Uh, and and certainly, the, and because he knew in, that in the case of that in the case of Psycho, that Herman was exactly right in putting the cue there, but um, but in the case of Torn Curtain. Um, I think Torn Curtain was a disaster from the very beginning, and not even and not even Herman could save it. Um, it's a. Uh, I think it's essential viewing for fans of Hitchcock, mm. just just because of its history. But um, it's really for people who who aren't generally Hitchcock fans that just see a couple of his pictures. It's one that you can skip. Um, right. But uh, but with Family Plot, I'm fairly sure that. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that John Williams was asked just based on his uh, um, success with Jaws. Although I was listening to an interview with Williams at one point, and he did because uh, he was friends with Herman, and he said, "Well, wouldn't you like to do this?" And Herman said, "No, no, 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 no. I've I've had my fun with Hitchcock. You go and have yours." <laughs> Sweet. So, um, and he was a he was a huge mentor to Williams, and um, and you know and. In his uh, AFI, in his acceptance speech for AFI, in his acceptance speech for the John Williams Award, which BMI just gave him this year, he never, he almost never fails to mention Bernard Herrmann's influence. It's so nice, and it's so. Uh, John Williams is a gentleman. Oh, he's every, a special man. In, oh, for sure. Every every sense of the word, and he's never, he's he's always quick to mention Herrmann, and just what an incredible influence he had on Williams' work. Um, but um, I think we're getting really off topic. And we need to discuss <laughs> I, North Bear West a little bit. I think it's but, okay for our first podcast. <laughs> right. So, so, Miriam. Yes. What did you think? What did you think of this masterpiece? Well, like I said, I mean, I'm still quite new to Bernard Herrmann's work. Um, I'm still quite new to Hitchcock's work, which is basically one and the same. Um, <laughs> Well, keep it, keep in mind they only made eight movies together, and this is out of some sixty that both of them made. Yeah, yeah, I, that's true. Um, but I mean, uh, against against you, who's seen North by Northwest, what did you say, fourteen times? <laughs> I mean, I had very little to say. Um, I mean, look, again, I I'm I'm not qualified to talk about these masterpieces, you know, I'm trying my best to, to, to you know, I'm an aspiring composer, I'm, I'm, I'm like a nobody in comparison, but I mean, I can tell what he set out to achieve with his score, and he did the job well, right. and, and what I love about Herman is, and this is something I observed from, from the three movies that I've seen with his, mm -hmm. with his scores for Hitchcock, is well, a couple of things. Like I mentioned at the beginning, he really allows um, he allows the audience to work things out for themselves, um, which I find quite unique. Like I don't find it very much in today's film scores. I feel like we're being a little bit spoon fed, uh -huh. um, and I think um, I think his choice his choices of when to put music into a movie is fascinating. Um, his silences are just as important, if not more important, than the music itself. Right, and um, among today's modern composers, Thomas Newman, 
has a very, very similar approach to spotting. Oh, and, I adore uh, Thomas Newman. I can talk about him forever. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I, oh I, I adore him um, as well. And then in the, in the middle of those two comes Jerry Goldsmith, who, mm-hmm. had a very, who also had a very similar sense of spotting. But getting back to Herman, um, yeah, keep going. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you keep going. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, just the final thing that I, I always liked about watching one of Hitchcock's movies um, is that Herman, I know you said that, that they had, these two had big egos, um, uh-huh. but when it comes to the job, he's not trying to impose his score on the, on the film, which I love. He really leaves loads of room for the dialogue to shine. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I, this is something that I've never actually picked up on before until I started watching Hitchcock's movies, which, which goes to show that it's something that stands out. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. And I, was, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy just letting yourself soak into the movie, understanding and, and appreciating each character and mm-hmm. then letting the music sort of be like an underscore. Um, um, and together with his timing, it, it's just perfect. He, he it, just... His, his music acts like a character. It's, it's another character in the movie. It knows when to, it knows when, um, it knows when it has something to say and it knows to hold back when it doesn't have anything to say. So yeah. it, reminds me of, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes that I actually used yesterday. And I think I've told you this quote before and I think um, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with music, but it's, it's a clever quote. And it was, mm-hmm. it was said by uh, Confucius and he said, um, it's better to remain silent and let people think that you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Well, that's probably that's probably true. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't think that quote appears in the Herman bio. But uh, if, if he if he had thought about that, I wouldn't be surprised. Of course. Also, also um, one of the one of the very interesting things about this picture is just the novelty of Herman's orchestration. Um, you look at uh, you look at the orchestration here, and I think. Um, because I have I have the score right in front of me. Oh, nice. Um, so uh, he's yeah he's using an orchestra of uh, almost the entire woodwind section. Um, he loved the sound of and which has influenced me the sound of uh, low woodwinds, low growling yes. bass bass clarinets and yeah. contrabassoons, and I love that. I love that. But. Um, he used a small string section for this movie. Um, you know, only sixteen violins, six viol, and that's in com- that's combining first and second. Um, six uh, violas, six cellos, three basses. So it um, so it really feels more agile, less less heavy, because um, you know, in comparison to something like Vertigo, which uses like a bajillion strings. Um, you know, the the smaller string section really gives a lighter feel and I think um, I was reading somewhere that Hitchcock wanted to do something lighter after the dark seriousness of Vertigo Mm -hmm. you know because Vertigo is uh, an extremely unrelenting movie it's a very heavy film and I think he wanted this as sort of a breath of fresh air and I I wrote a paper I wrote two papers about North by Northwest in college and Mm -hmm. And just uh, and one of them was largely on the score, and the other was largely on the film as a whole. And uh, and I think and I think that's probably the case. And I think because Vertigo was largely a failure um, on its initial release, now it's heralded as you know Hitchcock's greatest work and one of the absolute masterpieces of cinema. Um, I think he felt he needed to do something lighter and more fun. And North by Northwest is one of the most entertaining movies ever mm-hmm. made. Um, but, um, but Hitch, but Herman knows when to highlight, he'll let the woodwinds take over at a lot of different points. He doesn't, he doesn't over orchestrate. I think, um, that's one of, that's one of the key elements of Herman's work is that he doesn't do all this excessive doubling that we, you know, that we, we see, that we hear in scores from, you know, Max Steiner, as much as I love Max Steiner, I've never, ever diss Steiner, um, Mm -hmm. Or um, it's just a different approach. approach. It's a different approach entirely, and it's a mm-hmm. subtler and it's a subtler approach, and it makes the feels, it makes the scores to me feel um, more special. 
and I think, and you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at the score right now, um, just when he he lets certain instruments have their moments and then pull back to highlight, um, to highlight the woodwind section or highlight the brass section, and um, there's it's a, very there's intimate. A, it, it is very intimate, and yeah. I think I think also of the um, of what's known as the George Kaplan theme, mm -hmm. where there'll be a point where the strings will have it, and then they'll drop out to let the woodwinds have a small little um, piece of dialogue. And I think that um, uh, and it, it's very it's very characteristic of much of Herman's music. He'll have uh, one family sit. And let the other family take over for a little bit, and it's a really, um, it's a really interesting way of scoring things, and um, and I think we should play one of those examples right now. Okay, that sure. The, the, the thing we we haven't touched on in this is just the um, is the love dial is the love uh, the relationship between Cary Grant and Cary Grant's character Roger Thornhill and Eva Marie Sade's character mm -hmm. uh, Eve Kendall who uh, we all know that Hitchcock was obsessed with blondes and <laughs> you know and you know it got him into trouble at some points yeah um, but and he casted an assortment of different blondes uh, in his movies. Ingrid Bergman, um, Grace Kelly, uh, Kim Novak, Vera, Vera Miles, uh, Janet Leigh, and um, T.B. Hedren, which, you know, is the one that really set him. But um, but his, but my favorite, my personal favorite of all of them is Eve Marie Saint, and um, the class that she just brings to this movie is almost unparalleled, um, maybe by any other performer that I've seen in a Hitchcock movie. She gives one of the most dignified and one of the most interesting performances, um, certainly in the 1950s, and her character um, is certainly among the most interesting I've seen in a movie from either that decade or just film in general, I think, and the, um, the way she's able to spar um, and trade witty banter with Cary Grant. It just, it's one of the things that stands out to me the most about the movie. And I think about their scene, that wonderful scene with them on the train, either at dinner or later in her room at night. And Herman's music just helps to reinforce that. Mm -hmm. um, what they're saying is, you know, very, very witty and jabbing at certain points, but his music really is slowly seducing. Um, um, you know, mm -hmm. they're they're seducing each other really, mm -hmm. and uh, and the music you know beautifully expresses that. Um, it has a lot of really really interesting harmonies. He lets um, the light string section take over with a beautiful oboe solo, yes, uh, and then later taken over by a clarinet. And um, it's just uh, I, I actually had a professor, one of my professors in college, said. I like that love theme a little bit less, and I think uh, each time I watch the movie, and I think he's dead wrong. So, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah. um, as much as I love my professor who you know taught me so much about Herman, I think he's wrong in saying, <laughs> that, in saying that it's less each time he watches the movie. But that's well, that's you just true. become immune to its effects sometimes, I guess. Well, that's that's true, um, especially if you're studying this over and over, you know. Mm -hmm. um, which I imagine he has as a professor. So, oh yeah, do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. And this and uh, and my final my final project for that class um, was writing my paper on North by Northwest, and I covered this love theme a little bit. And maybe we should just play it for people to hear. Yes, let's.
Yeah, that is very, very beautiful indeed. I I love it. Um, and uh, and the whole and the whole score is really centered around these three themes: the Fandango, the George Kaplan theme, and the love theme. And from this very rich material comes one of his most stirring and stunning scores. Um, it's in it's in my top. It's not only in my top ten movies, uh, favorite movies of all time. It's in my top ten favorite scores as well. It's one that I listen to very, very frequently, and um, and each time each time I listen to it, I'm just drawn right back into that world that Hitchcock creates. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of it's one of my favorite movie worlds, and it's set in our world in the 1950s. And how, how of, would you describe that world in like one or two words? Like, it's sort of the loose beginnings of the Cold War, in a sense, but um, that has somewhat to do with the government, but also has retains a little bit of that in, innocence. It really, you know, um, a lot of people have called it the first James Bond movie, and let mm. me tell you something: the James Bond franchise has stolen from North by Northwest <laughs> an assortment of times. And there's a sequence in one of my favorite Bond movies, um, From yeah. Russia with Love where the chase sequence, there's a chase sequence in From Russia With Love that is taken almost shot for shot from North by Northwest. Yeah. And and that's and that's another really interesting thing, is just how Hitchcock set up these shots, because he storyboarded. He may not have written the screenplay, mm-hmm. but he sure as hell storyboarded mm-hmm. uh, his pictures. And um, but, that's uh, one of the things he... When, you know, when, I, when I give a little laugh, I'm not laughing, because I think what you're saying is doesn't make sense or is funny. I, 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 I'm laughing because of the conviction with which you say these things like you're mm-hmm. so uh, it's so apparent that you're such a staunch um, supporter of, of of their work together uh, uh, like I, I I may have mentioned that this is my favorite composer director collaboration yeah, yeah. Ever, mm-hmm. ever I mean the just the diversity um, of their work uh, crossing over different genres and we know that we know the big we know the big two you know, Vertigo and Psycho, but mm-hmm. North by Northwest, and The Trouble with Harry, too, which is which was their first picture, and one of Hitchcock's only pure comedies, and Herman got to write some really, it's, you know, it's a very, very funny movie, The Trouble with Harry. I, re- I highly recommend that people okay. see it, because it's, it's a, historically, mm-hmm. for both of them, it's very important, because it was their first movie together. Sure. And, I'm going to check that know, out, and putting it down on my list as we speak. The never-ending Miriam list. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> also, also never ending, large part thanks to me. But mostly, uh, yes. Thank you very much. You've, uh-huh. you've made me realize how little time I have in my day. We, uh, we all have. We, there's not enough time in the day. No, never. But, um, but uh, it was their first picture together, and it's largely about there's a man named Harry that's dead, and it's and it's just an inconvenience for the main cast. And that's kind of and that's kind of the type of humor that Hitch, <laughs> that Hitchcock uh, excelled in, and then, and Herman was really one of the only people who really understood that, uh, who understood Hitchcock's type of humor, and it's apparent in Trouble with Harry, and it's very apparent in North by Northwest too. Um, what is which that? There's many, a name which, for that kind of humor. It's not slapstick, well, is it? It's it's not slapstick, but it's this very wry, dry humor of yeah. uh, wry, uh, W R Y. Yeah, and, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> Spelling out for me. Not not referring not not referring to you know the type of liquor, but um, right. Okay, no but, right, uh, right. Yes. But uh, or, or the type of grain. <laughs> right, right, but. Um, <laughs> but I think, but there, there, it, there is something very special to be said about um, how much Herman understood um, what Hitchcock was trying to convey, and um, you know, there's a there's a point in there a point many times early in their collaboration where Hitchcock would say, "We should have all dialogue stop here because Mr. Herman may have something to say." Ah. And that's it, and, you know. And this was early enough in their collaboration where they were, they, where they were such good friends, and mm-hmm. you know, they had they hadn't let money and power and mm-hmm. um, where at least Hitchcock hadn't let money and power cloud his thinking because Psycho was a tremendously big success. It was Hitchcock's biggest mm-hmm. um, up to that point, and it made him, it made him not only very powerful, but it made him very rich too. Mm-hmm. And he knew that, and he tried to keep more and more of it for himself. Right. Um, so, 
Um, and Herman knew that deep down and just never, I don't think he ever called. I don't think anybody called out Hitchcock on it because how could you? This was the, this was the great and powerful Alfred Hitchcock. Of course. You, know, you, you cross Hitchcock and you're done. You're done, for uh, sure. You know, he, he had that kind of power. Um, <sighs> what else but, is new? Uh, <laughs> what else is new, yeah. Um, but, um, but their collaboration together is one of my favorite, is one of the most unique things in cinema history, I think. It's just a, it's a combination of a director who had one of the most distinctive visual styles and uh, a composer whose sense of psychology and spotting and orchestration, you know, we're still catching up with, we're still catching up with Hitchcock yeah. and Herman. We, we, should, um, we should probably wrap this up. Um, mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you, um, mm -hmm. as a conclusion to our podcast, yeah. um, when composers, new composers, or, or, or composers that are already experienced, when they're looking at the work of, of Bernard Herrmann, maybe even especially in collaboration with Hitchcock, mm -hmm. what would you want them to take from his work? What would you say that that is that one thing that, that Herrmann does that... A, a, an aspiring composer or a composer that's you know already advanced should implement in his work. You know the the Herman the Herman bias in me says there's more than just one, but I mean if I were to point out one thing above all others, it really is Herman's uh, approach to spotting and where mm -hmm. music where music is most effective because you know from from his earliest days of scoring um, and this goes this goes back to Citizen Kane. Um, he was doing things that no no compo no other composer no other director had sort of dreamed of, um, you know. And his approach, the way he opens, you know, most most Hollywood movies back then open with the cymbal crashes and the orchestra screeching and mm -hmm. no, no 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 no. This was not going to be the case for Kane. He starts out the movie with these low growling woodwinds and trombones and the quartet of alto flutes and it's very it's very effective they pull very, you right in it's they, very stylish and yeah. i'm getting chills i'm getting chills thinking about that mm -hmm. opening to kane right now it's it, it's just it's so iconic and so special yeah um and i think um and it's i mean his sense of orchestration is genius it's mm -hmm. you know genius is an understatement but mm -hmm. um really his approach his approach to where music is going to go and why it's being used is often the most important i think that we should probably mention here um before we finish um bernard herman from what i've read he bought or arranged his own his own orchestra didn't he he did um in the 19 in the 1930s and 40s and it was you know and he was dedicated to championing uh, the works of less known composers, most notably Charles Ives. Mm -hmm. um, and this and this was long before Leonard Bernstein was doing Ives with the New York Philharmonic. It was Herman who was doing right. Ives. So uh, basically why, why I bring this up is because he must have had a very deep understanding of orchestration just from having oh, yeah. his own orchestra alone and knowing how to place the individuals and uh, you know I'm no orchestrator but I, I imagine that had a great effect on his work. Oh, oh, but he said he said um, most prominently. Um, I'm trying to find the quote. I think he was talking with some other composers in Hollywood, and he was saying, "All right, guys, um, I'll give you a thousand bucks and the opening to the Lohengrin uh, Prelude by Wagner. I'm going to give it to you just the piano reduction, and I'll give you all the instrument art, uh, all the instruments marked." You write it out. I bet you won't come within fifty percent of Wagner. And then he <laughs> said, and then he said to orchestrate is like a thumbprint. I can't understand having somebody else do it. It would be like someone else putting uh, color to your paintings. And you know, and we just don't we don't see that uh, anymore because simply there's just not time. You know. Ah. Uh, hmm. You know, for for most for most composers, there's. Just, like no time. But, but, that, always... but that opens up a whole new conversation. Where, That's true. You know, whether or not you want to dedicate more time to one particular score and get it spot on, or mm -hmm. take on a few more projects and, well, maybe not have such a winner. 
I and I think I, I I think what I just said, not in regards to the Herman quote, but the but the follow up to that, I think that should be taken with a very big grain of salt, um, like the biggest grain of salt possible. Um, I mean, I I always try to do my own orchestrations um, when when I can, and you know, there's and being a film and theater composer, there are certain things that I mean, my orchestration tendencies are much more grand and symphonic oriented that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing theater orchestrations at the moment. And I know that's something that I need to work on, mm -hmm. but, um, I mean, I would love to do it one day because they, you know, in some ways it's a little, in some ways it's a little more personal. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, Herman was easily among the most gifted orchestrators ever to work in film. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess, uh, we'll, we'll leave off with one more cue. Um, and say thanks to our listeners. Um, you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to us ramble for mm -hmm. almost an hour. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, please drop your comments about this, uh, about this picture and about Hitchcock and Herman in the comments. And we'll probably have uh, a new poll ready in the next couple of days or so. Yeah, exciting. Thank you so much, Seth. All right, thank you, Miriam.